Who should be concerned about anal HPV? Well, most of us really should be have some concern about it at least. Um, however, some of us more than others. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to discuss, you know, who should be tested? Who, well, first of all, who should be concerned and, and why they should be concerned and who's at a higher risk of, of having anal HPV and um, you know how to test for it and, and what to do about it. And I'll, at the end, I, I'll talk a little bit about um, treatment in the event that you do have anal HPV or that you have anal dysplasia. So first of all, the reason we should be concerned about anal HPV is that it can cause anal cancer. Now, anal cancer is not a real common cancer. Um, it's, it's considered uncommon. So in the United States, at least, there's about 9,000 cases roughly per year. It's more common in women. So of the 9,000, maybe about 6,000 will end up being women, maybe about 3,000 will end up um, being men. The concern also is though the incidence of anal cancer is going up. So we're seeing more uh, men and women that are actually being diagnosed with anal cancer. Now, the mean age at which somebody's normally first diagnosed is you know, older, so it's a cancer that tends to affect older individuals. Um, most are diagnosed um, early 60s. So it's not, it's not something that a lot of us have on our radar for a couple of reasons. One is it's just not a real common cancer, but then we also don't do screening for it. It's, it's not, it, it's, you know, unlike a pap, you don't, we don't go in for our annual, you know, anal pap or our anal swab to check for HPV and for early um, precancerous changes or dysplasia like we do with a pap. So most people really aren't, aren't really thinking about it and they probably should be. So when you look at anal HPV prevalence, in other words, you know, who has it out of the population? If you just do a general sampling of the population, like a female population, it's about a similar, the, the prevalence is similar to vaginal and cervical or cervicovaginal HPV. So if you just screen the population for cervicovaginal HPV, it's about a third. So about a third of people uh, walking around, a third of women walking around will have cervicovaginal HPV but about a third will also have anal HPV, which is, I think, would be surprising to some. Now, when you look at male populations, the prevalence of high-risk anal HPV in men in, in this general population is a lot lower. Um, it's maybe about 8% or 10%, and there's reasons for that. Um, in women, you know, the anus is right next door to the vagina, so being in such close proximity, obviously you're going to get some cross sort of contamination or the ability to auto infect. So when you look at who, when in, in female populations at least, when you look at who has anal HPV, there's not a strong association with anal intercourse. And most people don't realize that. And again, it probably has to do, to do with the anatomy where it's just in such close proximity that you're going to end up getting some auto infection. And men, that's not the case. So if a male has a, a genital HPV infection and he's heterosexual, he's not having, you know, anal intercourse with other men, the chances of him having anal HPV is a lot lower. It's roughly about 8%. Now for men who are having intercourse with other men, then obviously the incidence or the prevalence of anal HPV is going to be higher and the rates of cancer are also um, higher. So that's not to say, obviously, if you're having anal intercourse, you're going to have more likelihood that you're going to have an anal HPV infection. And when you look at individuals getting anal carcinoma, the more male partners you engage in, whether you're male or female, the more male partners you engage um, in having anal intercourse, the more likely it is that you're going to develop anal cancer. So, um, you know, what can you do about that? Or what, what should a person do to test for that? Well, there is a test for that, in fact. Um, you can do an anal pap. And an anal pap is similar to, um, you know, cervical pap. So when you go in for your annual cervical exam, normally you use a little brush and a spatula and you kind of go into the canal of the cervix and then you can do a sampling from the outer cervix. It goes in a liquid medium and then that goes off to the lab. Now, when you talk about a PAP, a PAP is actually looking at cells. So there's some confusion sometimes about this, but an HPV test and a PAP are two separate tests. 
Now you can do the same tests or both tests off the same sample. So it goes in a liquid sample and that goes off to the lab. But off that liquid sample, you can do HPV testing and or you can do uh, cytology or cell testing where you're actually looking at the cells and determining whether there's any dysplasia or precancerous um, cells present. So the, um, you know, the, the, the descriptions that are given when you evaluate an anal pap are similar to that of a cervical pap where you have different levels of dysplasia. So you could have mild dysplasia anally and then you could have severe dysplasia anally um, and that would indicate that there's a problem that you should probably follow up with. So when you do an anal pap, um, the difference is you just use a sterile um, swab like this. So the swab goes in, it goes in about an inch and a half. Um, that's where the transformation zone is. So you go in about an inch and a half, you take a sampling there, it goes in the liquid medium and it goes off to the lab and then um, you get the results, you know, a week or two later. Now the transformation zone, the reason you go in about an inch and a half is just like with the cervix, there's a transformation zone, which is a zone where you're going from one cell type to another. And the cervix, it's normally right near the opening of the canal of the cervix. So that's where most cancers occur because those cells are particularly susceptible to HPV and to HPV um, initiating some dysplastic change. So in the anus, it's about an inch and a half in, you have the transformation zone where there's a this change from one cell type to another. So who should go in for a anal pap? If you are under the age of, and I'm going to divide this up into both into men and women, I'll try to cover all this, but let, let's start with um, if you're a woman and you're under the age of 30, I wouldn't go get an anal pap and I wouldn't do an anal um, HPV test. It's why concern yourself with it? The likelihood of developing anal cancer under the age of 40 is, is very slim, except in certain populations. So under the age of 30, would I do an anal pap if I'm a woman? No, unless if you're immunocompromised or you're immunosuppressed. So if you have HIV or some other type of immuno, um, immune deficiency, I would do an anal HPV test and, and probably an anal pap. And if you're immunosuppressed where you're on immunosuppressive medication, either for an autoimmune disease or if you've had organ transplant, sometimes you know you have to take immunosuppressive medications. But by suppressing the immune system, it, you know, the virus will end up causing more dysplastic change and it just makes it a lot more likely that you're going to have dysplasia and a lot more likely that you're going to end up developing anal cancer. So if you're under the age of 30, I wouldn't do a pap um, unless you're immunocompromised or you're immunosuppressed. And this is the same thing for men. Um, for men under the age of 30, if you're, if you're immunocompromised or immunosuppressed and you um, have intercourse, um, anal intercourse with another man, well then I would also do an anal pap and an a anal HPV test. But if you're under the age of 30 and you're male and you don't have anal intercourse, but you are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, I still wouldn't at that point recommend doing an anal pap. So over the age of 30, there again, I wouldn't probably just screen the general population for anal HPV or, um, or anal dysplasia, what I would do in that circumstance is if you are having a problem with HPV. So if you're a woman and you're having a problem and I define a problem as, you know, having HPV that's not going away. So where it's maybe more than two or three years. So having a persistent HPV infection and or having some persistent issues with dysplasia. So if you're over the age of 30 and you're having moderate or severe dysplasia, maybe you have a leap or some colonization or some sort of procedure like that, and um, it's either not gone or it comes back a year later or two years later. So if you're that sort of person where you've had a little bit more of an issue with it, where it either seems to be um, progressing quickly or it keeps coming back or you're not clearing HPV, um, then I would do an anal HPV and an anal PAP to check that because the, the sooner you know about it, the more, you know, the whole idea with doing screening procedures is to find, um, you know, ideally find a cancer in its pre-malignant state. In other words, before it actually has become cancer because you, you can treat it and you're going to be fine. So that's always the goal. If you're over the age of 30, again, for men, I suppose if, if you're over the age of 30 and you're, 
you're having um, intercourse with other men, um, I would do an anal pap test probably just on everybody, on any, any male having anal intercourse and any female having anal intercourse. I suppose this is another, um, um, another subset is if you're, if you're a man or a woman and you're having um, anal intercourse um, over the age of 30, then I would probably get tested too. It's surprising how, a little bit surprising, I mean, when I first started testing patients, um, I was kind of surprised that I was finding, you know, a fair number of women who were having anal HPV and, and even anal dysplasia, and some that were even having high um, grade dysplasia, in other words, severe dysplasia. Um, and, and again, most of the time those were in women that were having kind of more persistent problems with cervical vaginal HPV, Maybe they're not clearing HPV, um, and then they're having some issues with cervical dysplasia and things like that. Now what do you do? So you can do the anal pap, the anal HPV test, really easy. I, I would just do both. Um, if it comes back positive, in other words, if you have anal HPV and or you have some sort of what looks like some atypical cells or anal dysplastic cells, you should do, you should see a GI doc that specializes in that, like a colorectal type specialist. You can call, most of them deal with all this stuff now because it's, it's so common um, or common enough and, and rectal and anal carcinoma are common enough that, that they're looking for it. So most of them should, should know this. They, you know, your general doc will be able to do an anal HPV test. Usually a lot of gynecologists can do an anal HPV test, um, but colorectal and, and GI docs, most of them are gonna be able to do that sort of testing too. But if you have a positive HPV test, if you have a any dysplastic changes that are that are demonstrated on your anal pap, then you should do high resolution anoscopy. High resolution anoscopy is using a sort of like a speculum. So how to sort of like how you have a speculum that you can use vaginally when you do like a pap. There's an um, proctoscope or an anoscope that is a well, usually they're disposable, but it's sort of shaped like a plastic cone and it kind of goes in the anus. And what that does is it allows you to be able to use a light and then sort of the same thing like when you use it vaginally, you can see, um, you know, you can see, because otherwise you can't see anything in there. And you can use a light and it'll allow you to see that transformation zone where most um, dysplasia occurs. High resolution anoscopy is um, using a, a magnification device or a colposcope. So just like you can do colposcopic examination of the cervix, you can do colposcopic examination of the transformation zone in the um, anal rectal area. So the all the colposcope is just a, a device that allows you to look through it and magnifies the area. Um, the purpose of magnification is that once you apply acetic acid or like, kind of like a vinegar solution to the transformation zone, you, and they, this is how it's done on the cervix as well, you put this acetic acid on and then you can put Lugol solution on like an iodine and you let it stain and then you can more easily visualize areas that look like they're abnormal or dysplastic and by using magnification you can see it better and then you can do biopsy. So the purpose of doing the high resolution endoscopy is Ultimately, if it looks like there's something there, well, then you can do a biopsy and then you'll have a better idea whether it's whether there's any dysplasia or whether it's mild or severe dysplasia, and then you can have it treated accordingly. Treatment. So, what should you do if you have anal HPV? I would do a lot of the same things that I recommend for cervical or cervical vaginal HPV and dysplasia. So I talk about a lot of those things in my book. Um, I don't talk about anal dysplasia or anal HPV specifically in my book, but the same sorts of supplements, the same sort of diet is going to be applicable in, the, in any HPV infection for that matter. Um, so first and foremost, you want to you know, change your diet, make sure that you're doing a plant-based diet. Plant-based diet helps clear um, HPV. It helps your immune system primarily help clear HPV. You get about a 50 to 60% improved likelihood of clearing HPV, at least cervical vaginally. So you want to try to adopt more of a, especially a whole food, plant-based type of diet is going to help you clear the HPV. And then a lot of the supplements, folic acid, um, maybe curcumin, things like that. Again, I, I talk about all those in my book. I have a link down below in the description of this video that goes to Thorn Research. Thorn, I use a, a lot of the supplements I use, I use from Thorn. Not necessarily all of them, but 
Um, a lot of them I do get from Thorn Research, so I have the link down below that'll allow you to order directly from Thorn Research if you choose to do that. So a lot of the supplements that I would normally use are in my dispensary, so that link brings you to my dispensary at Thorn Research where you can order those things if you like. And then also I have a link down below for my book because the book describes a lot of um, just the general ideas about HPV, what HPV does, how it causes dysplastic change, why diet and supplements helps block um, HPV from causing those dysplastic changes. If, if you don't, you know, you could have anal, same thing, and I've said this before, cervically and vaginally, you, you know, if not for the fact that HPV could cause cancer, uh, there's no significance to it. So you could have anal HPV the rest of your life and never develop cancer. So um, it's just that we don't know who's going to develop cancer and who's not going to develop cancer. So if you do have anal HPV, you want to be preemptive or proactive and try to do everything you can to block the virus from causing those dysplastic changes. I hope this video was helpful. If um, you have any questions, just reach out to me. You can email me and hopefully I can answer those. And um, if you like this video, please hit the like um, button. And if you want future content such as this, just subscribe to my channel.